Adam Pope here for PopGeeks.com, and I'm excited to be talking to a real-life member of Starfleet, who, in addition to being featured on Star Trek Prodigy Season 2, available now on Netflix, and appearing in person at Dragon Con and the Fort Collins Comic Con this August, is also a bona fide astrophysicist, a distinction that puts her in demand as a science advisor for the Star Trek franchise and other shows like Space Cadet on Amazon Prime. This is all in addition to being a celebrated writer and film producer with all that going on it's amazing to get a few minutes with you dr aaron mcdonald how you doing i'm good thank you it's a pleasure to be here thanks for having me yeah this is gonna be great now first things first i do have to say my wife and son were binging star trek prodigy recently they loved every minute of it my best friend has a star trek podcast called trekology now i'm here talking to you so i'm surrounded by star <laughs> trek on all fronts but i wanted to know to your knowledge are you the first person to portray yourself as a member of starfleet in the star trek canon Oh, that's a good question. And you had a good qualifier there that said uh, in Starfleet, because the only other person who's ever portrayed themselves was Stephen Hawking. So like no pressure, <laughs> uh, but he was a, a hologram version of himself that they had created data had created to play poker with a bunch of physicists. And um, uh, but yeah, I'm playing myself as an a, a professor at Starfleet Academy, which is honestly my dream job. So <laughs> I'm good with that. And what would you say that what is the biggest difference between earthbound Dr. Aaron McDonald and Starfleet officer and Lieutenant Commander Dr. Aaron McDonald? <laughs> um uh that's that's it. I haven't really thought about it because for me it's all just I'm, it's me. I don't know how I end up there. <laughs> but uh maybe I'm a time traveler, maybe I'm yeah, plucked out, uh maybe I'm a Q and I just don't know it yet. Um, but yeah, I guess it is funny because when I was in grad school, I was like, oh my God, my dream job would be a professor at Starfleet Academy, but I can't do that. So I have to do something else. So, um, yeah, I guess I've just been a time traveler in the future and I don't nice. know how to do that yet. <laughs> So what came first then for you? Was it a fascination with the science of the universe or was it Star Trek fandom? I didn't really get into Star Trek until I was studying my undergraduate degree. And the joke I always like to say is like the Venn diagram of Star Trek fans and physics majors is pretty, pretty strong. And so I, it was inevitably exposed to Star Trek, but I was already interested in space and physics and, and had that love from other media, like the X-Files or Contact and all that other stuff. But um, but then when I was in graduate school and I was really just deep diving and watching Star Trek all the time, that's when I started kind of putting those pieces together where, you know, I was doing my PhD in general relativity and procrastinating my dissertation. <laughs> and I was like, I bet I could figure out how warp drive actually works. And so that's where I sort of started diving into the science behind Star Trek and yeah, just went from there. Oh, nice. Uh, now, your career has quite had quite an emphasis, I would say, on education, creating an appreciation for an understanding of astrophysics uh, among the general populace. So you you even wrote a, a Star Trek, my first book of space for babies. So you're, you're starting them young there. Uh, but for you personally, what is it about the universe that you would say we're maybe taking for granted here on Earth, like that warrants further study by the average drone? Like, why not consider consider this oh that's a that's I love that I think like for me you know we never lose that sense of wonder when it comes to space like I think that that's something that we all still stand in awe of you know I was fortunate enough to be able to see the total solar eclipse this past year and just seeing all of these people like caravanning down to the path of totality was just an amazing thing to see and I think what we take for granted is when it comes to like the dollars and cents of space, not travel necessarily, but just learning more about our universe. You know, these programs are really expensive. Sending a probe to Europa to see if there could be microbial life is a long, expensive process. And many times I think the public will go like, why are we spending that money? We have so much else we need to worry about, so much else here on Earth we should be spending our money on. and Really, though, we have to remember that space is so hard and so difficult and presents us with so many challenges that that money, that investment is not just what we could learn, which in itself is grand, 
but it also can be invested in many other things. It's just unknown unknowns that we aren't sure how that could impact our society, but it's worth the risk to me. So I just think we should be throwing more money at space exploration and taking on those risks and those long projects because you never know what could come out of that. And in that vein, can I also ask this? Are black holes as cool as a lot of science fiction entertainment makes them out to be? Or is there a more interesting phenomenon we are overlooking? Oh, uh, well, I do think black holes are just objectively awesome. I think the biggest misunderstanding with black holes is that they're not sucking material in. We always talk about them as the black holes are, you know, sucking in stuff. They're not going around hoovering up, you know, galaxies and stuff, but they are steep gravitational wells. And for me, it is my favorite science word of all time, which is spaghettification, which is what would happen to you as you fall into a black hole. You just get spaghettified because of the gravity gradient. But yes, I mean, there's so much cool stuff out there, but black holes kind of continue to take the cake. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, we kind of mentioned this, you have multiple pop culture convention appearances scheduled this year. And, you know, just in general, you've made a lot of appearances on panels and things like that. So what is your favorite thing about the convention experience? And do you have a pet peeve, something you've experienced? You're like, this always happens. Why? <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, I when I first started going to Star Trek conventions, even before I was associated with the franchise, but I was giving science talks like physics of Star Trek. I was having overwhelming stress dreams about being well actually by the audience. So it's like, well, in episode 12 of season four of The Next Generation, like actually they said this. And that could not be further from the truth, as I found, as I go to conventions like Star Trek fans, yes, love to get into the minutia of stuff, but they're mostly just excited to be around other people that when they say in episode you know, 12 of season four, people are like, oh yeah, that episode. <laughs> so uh, I I love that atmosphere. I love that it's like a third place for people that people can just fully express themselves. And uh, being a nerd myself, I get to geek out at these conventions as well. And so, um, yeah, I absolutely love it. I love interacting with the public. The only pet peeve is that I just don't have enough time to answer all the questions that people have for me. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm curious, what is the most common question right now? Like, are, do people try to get into like, oh, well, tell me about Prodigy. Tell me about your character there. Are they asking about the secrets of the universe? Like, what, what do people want to know? What are they most curious about? Well, other than can I get information about future Star Trek series out of you? <laughs> uh, I think the most common question is honestly, like, what technology does Star Trek have that we could possibly have in the future? And a lot of it we already have, even if you go back to 1966, things like the flip phones or video conferencing, all of this is just standard use now, if not already dated. But unfortunately, the biggest one I get asked about is a transporter and physics says no for now. <laughs> my <laughs> short enough. answer for that, yeah. <laughs> um, and what has been then at this point since you've you know, been so ingrained in the universe on screen and behind the scenes, like what's been the biggest geek out moment for you? Was it like contributing something? Was it meeting somebody? Like what's it been? So it actually just happened. <laughs> Originally, so I had a wonderful moment with Jonathan Frakes when I was first hired where he just kind of very graciously like welcomed me to the Star Trek family, which was a really kind of big special moment. But this year at San Diego Comic-Con, they were doing a Star Trek prodigy panel and I was lucky enough to actually get time to meet and speak with Kate Mulgrew beforehand who played Captain Janeway and she is my captain and I have a huge Voyager tattoo on my arm. And at the panel, she kind of stopped for a second and she was like, can we just talk about like how good the science is and can we recognize our science advisor who's here in the audience? Um, so my captain, oh, captain, my captain, <laughs> took time out of a panel to recognize me at San Diego Comic-Con. And I, that it's the peak, honestly. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow, that is so cool. Um, it's, <laughs> speaking of which, so what is it that is your main focus when you're trying to offer something to Star Trek, when you're getting a script and you're looking it over? Like, what? how do you present it without saying the, well, actually? Awesome. I, I like to approach science advising with a yes and attitude. And so when they come with a 
you know, an idea. I mean, you know, literally like this happens all the time. I'll get an email of like, hey, I read this cool article about some space phenomenon. Can we do that? <laughs> and instead of being like, oh, probably not, you know, I I take the approach of like, heck yeah, let's do it. Let's figure out how to do it. These are the ways to talk about it. These are the important things you need to know. And this is the what you want to stay away from because really fundamentally my job at the end of the day, if I don't do anything else, is just make sure we don't say something that's explicitly wrong. <laughs> and that's the most important thing. But we can play with a lot of stuff. Star Trek has a lot of its own technology. It's in the future. Who knows what we discover between now and then. So I do concede a lot of wiggle room. I try to be you know, positive and Im improv a lot of uh, approaches that we could take. But as long as we're not explicitly breaking and saying something wrong when it comes to the science, that's my number one job. Nice. Uh, now, uh, stepping away from Star Trek a little bit, what can you tell us about this Space Cadet series on Amazon Prime? What's its focus? What are you doing there? Yeah, so it's actually a film. Um, and it came out, I think, at early July. And yes, on Amazon Prime, the way I like to phrase it is that it's basically legally blonde goes to NASA. <laughs> and, and it's such a good, I think, example of the job of science advising and the complexity of it, because it is a really fun, kind of goofy film that, you know, it's, I think it's PG-13. You can watch it with your family. It's, it's pretty fun. Um, but you have to realize as the science advisor coming in what tone they're going for. And so just being like, this is not The Martian. This is not Interstellar. We're not going for like hard sci-fi here. We are going for a comedy. Um, so again, we'll let a lot of stuff go. The main thing is just don't say anything wrong and just add some color to some of the scenes, right? When they have people who are experts talking, make sure that they are saying the right things. But other than that, yeah, have fun. <laughs> Awesome. Well, as we close out here, I'm just curious, just getting back on the education side of things for people who feel like they have an interest, but they're like, they're, I could never conceive of this stuff. I could, you're like, I want to know, but could I really understand? What is your encouragement to people who are looking to learn more about astrophysics and things of that nature? You know, there's lots of great resources out there. It's just trying to find the right balance for your level. And I do think there's there's so much that sometimes it can be overwhelming. And honestly, doing a quick Wikipedia search is probably one of the worst things you can do because many scientists have written the science pages on Wikipedia and they are heady and deep and hard to comprehend sometimes. But exposing yourself to things like NPR's Science Friday is really good, um, you know, space.com, astronomy news, all of that will have really good headlines. You can get those things delivered. And I think that just starting to get a little bit more aware of what's going on in the space industry is that those are the places I would start with. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been great. And uh, hey, all the best. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate it.